Good morning. I'm James Brooks. I'm Provost Emeritus of SMU. And this morning we're here uh, to visit with Frank C. Uh, Frank had the uh, opportunity to work for almost 20 years as executive assistant to four SMU presidents and two provosts during the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. And having sat next to important decision making and been a part of other important decision making, this is a an important opportunity for us to talk with him about uh, events that happened during those three decades in the history of SMU. Good morning, Frank. Uh, let's start out a little. You you uh, were born in 1913, and you went to the University of Texas and took right. a degree in physics. Right. And uh, had an interesting career before and during World War II. Right. Uh, as I mentioned to you a little earlier, uh, I, I was born in 1913, so I was a, a little older than SMU, <laughs> and I guess this qualifies me as a geriatric, so if I make any <laughs> pauses or gaffes, you'll... Uh, you're, you're among friends and in, in good company, I will assure <laughs> you. Uh, uh, I, I was at the university, I got a degree in physics, and then in 1941, um, I had a research fellowship there, working on organ pipe. Incidentally, Boner, Dr. Boner, was an organist. Uh, and uh, at that time, the country was not officially at war, but they were heavily involved in the North Atlantic because of the German submarines. There was a tremendous loss of of uh, tonnage, tonnage, both there and in the actually in the Caribbean also. Uh, this lab at Harvard, the Harvard Inter Underwater Search Lab, <coughs> was recruiting people from all over, and uh, because of the fact they were working in anti-submarine warfare, this involved sonar and listening, so they were looking for people in acoustics. So five of us from the university were more or less drafted to go up there. Um, well, now this was during the period when we had the Lend-Lease program before we yeah, formally entered the war. We weren't in the, we were actually, actually very much involved, although it wasn't official. Yes, war had not been declared. Not until December, December 7th. Right. Um, the Harvard lab, was involved with Bell Telephone Labs in uh, developing sonar, and there were other other groups working, but those are the primary uh, groups uh, for detection of uh, enemy ships. And um, very vital to that work was having good hydrophones, hydrophones that were uh, able to meet the environmental needs and also could listen forward and not hear it, their own noise, their own ship noise. Yeah, um, picking up the, the sound of, uh, of uh, propeller enemy, noise. Yeah, propeller noise from enemy submarines. Uh, well, uh, or, that's right. Or any enemy uh, ship. Ships, at that time it was ships. Yeah. Uh, the, the submarine uh, detection was being developed at that time. Uh, the, I had, shortly after I'd been there, I, we were in the basement of uh, the physics building I, at Harvard. I was on, on loan to Dr. Phil Morse at, at MIT. They were specifically working on hydrophones. The Harvard lab was not, not only developing hydrophones, but the electronic circuitry to go with it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, one of my, one, my first assignment there was to work with Dick Bolt. This is Richard Bolt, who is, you've probably heard of Bolt, Brannick, and Newman. Yes. This was the Dick Bolt that I worked with. We were assigned to uh, try to set up a listening work network for Boston Harbor. 
and it was located the little array. The, well, the array was actually in, uh, out in out in the uh, in channel the, ahead in the of channel, yeah, ahead of Boston Harbor. But there's a little house on Deer Island where we set up. We had a big uh, display of uh, there were five speakers on this board that supposedly would give you an indicator of which one, was, uh, which area was involved with the particular speaker. Um, we had these hydrophones on a metal tripod that we dropped. Uh, out in the uh, water, uh, and um, it operated. Now this was cr Christmas, uh, just about Christmas of '41. Uh, we were getting good signals. And suddenly everything stopped. It turned out we had tremendous cable problems because of the currents out there. This we had a steel jacketed cable, but it lasted just about uh, 10 um, days. <laughs> and we had to go to a, a one that was about an inch thick. Uh, to make a long story short, we had the um, um, mine de detecting ship, I forget what they were called, lay the these, and we got it working. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you really were involved with that during the entire war, that kind of activity? No. No. I got that going. Uh, I was recalled to Harvard in spring of 42, and that network then, by that time, it was wor working pretty well. In fact, uh, they had a couple of scary uh, incidents, but they never, it never amounted to uh, intercepting an uh, uh, enemy ship. An enemy ship. Uh, no, that uh, there was a Navy listening post up on the uh, hill adjacent there to Deer Island that they took that over, and I, I think it continued on during the war. I was sent back to Harvard, and I immediately got involved in uh, homing device uh, acoustic, signals, yeah. acoustic torpedoes. The first. Uh, um, one was uh, uh, about a five foot long uh, tube. No, it, it was a small torpedo, is what it amounted mm -hmm. to, battery operated, uh, and it was designated under the, the name Fido. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember our first run was in Lake Quinsigamon, uh, there in western Massachusetts. And uh, the, fir the first run we made was a flop. It it didn't. We had uh, we also uh, Harvard also had the developed a target, a, a noise maker, yeah, yeah. S to simulate a ship, simulate um, propeller noise. Propeller noise. And uh, anyhow, this this first run went wrong and it, the device climbed up out of the water onto shore and right at the base of a tree. So it, it, <laughs> it, it its name Fido was, was very <laughs> propitious. So you had some fine tuning to do on that development. Yeah, and that went on uh, there in, at that location, but also uh, as, the, as we got more uh, Sophisticated in our circuitry and so <laughs> forth, I was sent down. There was a, uh, Harvard uh, set up a lab in Fort Lauderdale, right at Port Everglades, that, which at that time they, they chose that because that was the deepest uh, uh, channel, port, port. deepest port along the eastern coast, mm -hmm. and we were set up in, on a little. Uh, laboratory there <clears throat> and 
we made runs, actual, actual runs, against a surface boat. And I'm going over a lot, uh, escaping a lot of the, <laughs> yeah. the but well. the first run was in a little, uh, chasing a small 16-foot boat. And this device uh, followed that boat completely, perfectly on, on our morning run there. And the, there was a Navy officer that took movies of that. We could see the, yeah. in the wake, see this thing sure. chasing us. And uh, I took, took those movies back to Harvard and, and they were very, <laughs> Very useful and very useful, and it, it was kind of sensational at the time. They were very pleased. Then <clears throat> the next step in this was to uh, uh, <clears throat> build this into what was then the old Mark 13 torpedo. That's the one that uh, you may may remember yeah. in the Pacific. Was the, were the duds yes. were from World War One? Uh, we. Uh, had a Navy chief that was fixed this up to where we could uh, make a run on out in out in the Gulf Stream with a target at a at a distance of a, of about I guess it was probably 800 yards or so and. Uh, So you you were involved then in, in guided bombs as well. That's right, and we. Uh, well, I, I was a observer and air observer for those runs, as well as being on the uh, boat that that launched them, as well as the target boat. And it so happened, and we were having successful runs. What what would happen? This thing would would seek the target. It was set at a certain depth, uh, uh, depth, uh, and uh, after it after it passed the target, it was fixed so that the water in the head, where the hydrophones were, was spewed out and. Uh, flu fluorescein, green fluorescein, was located so we'd go pick it up and use it again. Uh -huh. uh, and then this one, one particular one, I was in the target boat, and when we saw the thing, we, uh, it, the depth control went sour and it was porpoising. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were, we were in the very apprehensive, of course, it came up and hit the target boat, got lodged in the, uh, in the gunnel, and as the boat uh, rocked, rocked the, its propellers raced, and so it, it centrifuged and, it, and tore out the, uh, <laughs> the, the side of the, there was a piece of metal that came and hit the, uh, the coxswain of the boat. I still have that piece of metal. <laughs> we, you were glad to be through with that run. Yeah. Anyhow, we, we, that it stuck in that boat, and we went back to lab with that boat. Uh. And we've we've used that. Uh, well, you you obviously had some interesting experiences uh, during World War II, and. Um, we could talk all hour about that, but yeah. I'd like to fast forward. Really, you had an interesting career uh, after the war at CBS and at Collins Radio, among others. But then let's move to, to Texas Instruments because that was the immediate precursor of your becoming involved with SMU. Right. The reason I've gone into all of this, uh, in order to, I wanted to get with the graduate research center that was going to be headed up by Berkner. And I, I felt that I needed the technical <laughs> uh, background for that so that I, when, uh, 
Well, first, let me go back. I, at TI, I, uh, I was in the, in the, um, the research uh, after they had moved out uh, on uh, out on North, North Central Expressway. Central Expressway. I worked for Ross Ross McDonald, who headed up the um, research division. Yes. And I did, I got into technical writing with with that. Um, I had, I guess it was in sixty. No, it was in fifty eight or fifty nine. I had heard of the fact that SMU was talking about a graduate research center, and I I went and, and talked to Eric Johnson while I was at who working was, for TI. Who was the head of TI at that time? And told him that I would be interested in in working on working that. Working on that, uh, and. Dr. Berkner was on the TI board, and he was the one that was selected uh, eventually in in the '61 to head up this lab, the Graduate Research Center. The Graduate Research Center. Now that started at SMU in uh, 1961. 1961, Claude Albritton. Uh, right. Got that out. No, Claude Albritton got this. This was. It, it, uh, in July 61, this was uh, predominantly SMU. He had well, this was commenced. Uh, uh, let, let me interrupt just a minute and see if my recollection is correct. Um, the the TI trio, Johnson, Green, McDermott, had contributed the money to build the science library, the Science That's Information correct. Center. Science Information Center. And that Center. was that was the preamble to the creation of the Graduate Research Center. That was part of yeah. that was part of Berkner's ideal. Yeah, um, and uh, and that was in that started in what in fifty nine, and then ultimately the GRC was created in sixty one. Sixty one. Yeah, yeah, and it was really created at that point primarily in relation to SMU. That's, My, uh, that's what the people on the campus thought that, and Claude Albritton thought that, but back Claude, who was graduate dean then. Yeah. But in the minds of of the the, the founders, tri the triumvirate and Berkner, they might have had a much broader view. And when Berkner got here, he, uh, I, well, I might. Why don't you talk a little bit about Berkner, and yeah, then let's get it, back to this story he, he, because Berkner, knowing about Berkner, is key to understanding a he, lot of other things. That's right. He's he's a very interesting man. He. Uh, he, when in Admiral Byrd's first uh, trip to uh, Antarctica, he was the, the, at 17 years of age, he was a, a radio operator that kept in touch with him through, he was a, what do you call it? Ham radio. Ham radio. And then when, later when uh, Byrd uh, flew to Antarctica, Berkner went with him. Byrd, Bach, the pilot Balkan, do you remember, and Berkner uh, uh, went down there, and, and he, he he was the one who was kept radio contact with yeah. the with the United States. He, well, uh, well, now he didn't have any academic degrees, did he? He had he got, had a master, masters, uh, bachelor's and masters. He had twelve. Honorary degrees. Yeah, but he doctoral degrees. He he was a large man, very prepossessing, and he he dominated any group that he was with. He had a presence. He had a very strong presence. He was very active in the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy uh, of Engineering, Academy of Engineering, and in a lot of different government posts. I could. Go on and and that's how Johnson made became impressed with him and watching him at work in the government. That's correct. Yeah, and and brought him aboard at first on the TI right. board and then right. to head GRC. Yeah, uh, I want to be sure I'm understanding. That's correct. Uh, well, uh, now you've talked 
Berkner was clearly um, somebody that was a mover and a shaker. Very much so. He, uh, he moved in the very highest echelon of scientific Realms. Activity, yeah, yeah, and and consequently impressed the the triumvirate as you Very call much. them, Johnson, Very much Green, so. McDermott. Uh, well, now what was the stated purpose of GRC first as it was conceived on the campus, and second as it really was? Well, as you mentioned, it, uh, a key to it was the. Uh, Science Information Center here that was built here at that time. Uh, it had just been completed in 61 and uh, when Bertner came here uh, he and, and his troop had offices on the first floor there. Uh, I was the first uh, hire I guess uh, aside from secretaries and, and a fellow by the name of Stoll who handled his yeah, you were his executive assistant. Right. And uh, my first assignment with him was, he, uh, in, they were talking uh, about the uh, technical connection between libraries. And I, I was assigned to visit libraries throughout the state uh, to get an a, a appraisal of uh, the, how that might be, be connected. Yeah. I remember on a visit to Rice, LeVan Griffiths, who later came here, was dean of, there at Rice at that time. And uh, my first assignment then was to, in, in the area of library. Uh, but interinstitutional connections and that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, what now what was, what was the role at that time? You mentioned Claude Albritton, and he was one of the principal movers on the SMU campus. That's right. Well, uh, Gene McIlvaney was uh, chairman of the chairman board of trustees. Board of, tr no, of trustees at that time. Trustees, yeah. And uh, what was he? He was very close to Willis Tate, the president of the university. Yeah. What was their role in all this? Well, they. They were very much uh, interested in establishing this graduate research center, according to this. Uh, but when Berkner came here, he, his idea was to become uh, the center, the technical focus. focus of the whole Southwest. And, and he wrote the article in the Southwest Review, or not the Southwest Review, but the uh, Maybe the New Yorker, uh, one of the major national magazines, talking about uh, bringing water to the arid Southwest. That's right. Figuratively uh, speaking. And uh, uh, as I say, he is a dominant sort of personality, and as a result, some of the schools in the area were offended by the fact that. <laughs> but uh, he he had the backing of the triumvirate. The uh, financial backing and was able to hire very uh, uh, high-level scientists, Anton Hales and yes. Frank Johnson and others, uh, so that uh, this in, a, in effect overshadowed the concept that w Willis Tate and others had as, as to SMU's role in this. Uh, so effectively, SMU at the end of the day ended up with the science library, and that was really about all. That was about it. Uh, Eric Johnson and Texas Instruments uh, had built, their money had built the science library. And I remember Eric was very interested in having engineering personnel and so forth on the third floor there. And it turned out that uh, in the design of it, the, the, the people that would have occupied that would have had to gone through the- Through the library. Through the library. On one elevator, he was thought that, he, he was hoping there would be a separate library. So uh, there was, that's the now existing outside- Stairway. <laughs> stairway <laughs> became a very- 
It was a bone of contention. Very large bone of contention. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> between, really, between Willis and Eric. That's right. That's right. Uh, because it got kind of personalized at that Very point. Very much so. Uh, do you have any feeling that, that um, and you may not want to respond to this, do you have any feeling that we, that we SMU could have played our cards differently and had it come out differently, or was this driven possibly so much so, by? Possibly so. I think if there had been a, a warmer relation between the, tri, the TI people, and Eric Johnson particularly, that the SMU's engineering department could have been the focus of this. Yeah. yeah. But that, that, that didn't, didn't happen. happen. It didn't, it didn't happen. happen. Well, then in 1962, the Graduate Research Center, now the Graduate Research Center of the Southwest. That's right. Came into being. That's correct. And that was derivative from GRC, Inc. That's right. Uh, I don't and want to put words in your mouth. I'm, oh, these that's are right. questions. One of my first jobs was to develop this thing, that, uh, and it was called the Charter of Progress, and it it uh, had a big uh, view of the future in the Southwest for from the standpoint of producing PhDs. Uh, uh, in the intellectual wasteland, that's as, right. as Berkner had described that's right. it. And uh, that was my my first big job with Berkner, and he was very pleased with this because this uh, was widely distributed, and it set the tone. The newspapers and all picked it up that look, we're going to start producing scientific PhDs in this area. Yeah, yeah. I might back up <coughs> uh, before all of this. I, uh, I had been involved in the, in 1957 there was Sputnik occurred, yeah. and there was a group here in Dallas that organized the Council of Sci uh, Scientific Societies, it joined the IRE and Chemical Society and others, and uh, during that period I had become, uh, I had been president of the local IRE chapter. I became president of this Council of Scientific Societies, and all of this group of people became closely involved in all the graduate research centers. Did, did that lead to the uh, formation of the Metropolitan Philosophical Society, which was another Berkner creation? It, that was an offshoot. Yeah. 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 I hadn't thought about that for 30 yeah. years. That's right. Uh, but the individuals, uh, uh, Cecil Green, uh, Earl Cullum, yes, people of that sort were in this Council of Scientific Society got immediately involved in Berkner's plans for the Graduate Search Center of the Southwest. Um, well, now. Um, uh, Someplace along the line, and you know the, there was a very confusing uh, development of nomenclature between, in sequence more or less, between the Graduate Research Center as it was originally conceived, the Graduate Research Center of the Southwest, the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies. SCAS. And That's right, and the University of Texas at Dallas. That was kind of a lineage. Well, that was later. SCAS yeah. was the intermediate uh, development. After GRCSW. That's right. And and what was the purpose of that then? Well, Why it was, was just a continuation of 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 the idea uh, of having a and center for scientific activity in this area that would just be pour out preeminent and uh, PhDs. That was. <laughs> And Frank Johnson was the president of SCAS. That's, that's correct. And he, and he let, went on later to be the first president of UTD. Right. Uh, well, then you came along in 1964. You actually came into the university from... Yeah, my, uh, my last assignment with uh, Berkner, the major assignment, was the, to build the, the uh, first building on the property uh, out in, in 
in Richardson. Plano, Richards in Plano. Uh, the Founders Building. The Founders Building. Uh, I, it was my job to work with the architect and the contractor and all and get that built. And that was my last uh, assignment, assignment with him. And Burton was very pleased. I have some <laughs> letters from him complimenting the work well, that went on in that building. Doesn't surprise me. Uh, the, the um, holdings of the GRCSW involved 76 acres, of which some were sold off later, plus uh, this building. And uh, well, I remember it sitting out in the middle of cotton fields in that's North right. Richardson. That's right. On Cam off of Campbell Road. Yeah, I had. Uh, well. Uh, then when you came to work for, I, I want to make sure we cover our ground here. Uh, when you, when you, in 64, when you came to SMU, you kind of jointly reported to Jesse Hobson, who was a vice president for, for research and government relations or something like that. Yeah, that was. Uh, and, that was and, and to Willis jointly. Yes, that's correct. For, for six months, I was uh, on, on the, the payroll of, of both GRC and, Ber and Berkner and, and SMU. SMU. Uh, well, well, now there were a bunch of things that uh, that you did really in in behalf of Willis, or really as an alter ego for Willis Tate, in in uh, in that period of the '60s and early '70s. Um, the Bradfield Computing Center was something you had under your purview. Well. Uh, it wasn't under my purview, but that was part of the, the picture. Uh, I remember uh, Ross Perot was trying to sell Berkner on the idea of a, uh, a, a computer for Berkner's dream. And at the same time, he was working with SMU to try to sell them a, And I remember uh, he arranged a trip to IBM in which Berkner and Willis Tate, myself, and uh, one other guy from uh, GRC that he had hired, I forget his name, as a, com as a computer man, went up and visited IBM. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he then, sold a machine here. And he sold a machine to SMU. And uh, that, uh, that was lodged in the building on the campus, a special building at that time. You know, this was punch card only. Right. And it, Called for a lot of air conditioning because these were still vacuum tubes. Yes, and uh, the uh, air conditioning was in a separate below floor. Yeah, the floor was about a foot high. That's right, and uh, the whole investment probably was well over a million dollars. And what that machine was able to do, what I own now today, sitting on your desktop, on PC, PC, uh, a PC would do a thousand times faster and better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. That was, and that was the Bradfield Computing Center, which in, right. as we talk has just been torn down to make way for the Collins Is that right? Executive MBA I, building. I didn't know that. Yeah, just, well, it well, just happened. Ross Perot, that was probably one of his biggest sales before he went into business for himself. Yeah. Well, he was still with IBM then. That was an IBM, and I forget the name of it, but the IBM computer. Yeah. Well, then there were, was a series of other things that you did that were kind of interinstitutional things that I think are important part yeah. of the fabric. The Inter-University Council, IUC, yeah. ICUT, uh, and TAGR. That's right. Well, let's, let's All of these were, were interinstitutional arrangements. Um, I, my first assignment with Hobson was was to, uh, and I thought this was in connection with both SMU and GRC, <clears throat> was to go to uh, interview deans of engineering schools in Pennsylvania. I went to Villanova, Drexel, Penn, uh, University of Penn, and uh, Penn State probably. Penn State and Lehigh. And I made a big report with that, uh, and I 
didn't know until later this was kind of a private <laughs> consulting <laughs> consulting arrangement that Hobson had. <laughs> Well, but we both know that Hobson was was he was uh, an operator. He was an operator. He was an operator. Bertner himself you could be designated as a very high level operator. He, uh, That's right. He was a very distinguished guy, but he uh, he was a, a prime mover. Yes. Um, well, now what was let, what about what was the purpose of IUC? What was the purpose of ICUT? What was the what was Tager all about? Okay, I, uh, I, IUC was primarily a library arrangement, and you were then tied in with the OCLC, the Ohio That's right. College. Well, that the OCLC was a result of this IUC endeavor. John Gwynn, who was up head of the women's school in what was then Women's yeah, University. Texas Women's University. Yeah. And, uh, and others uh, were involved in the IUC. The, this got finally headed up by a fellow by the name of Hunter out in uh, Abilene Christian College. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, its main purpose in, in, in life was to work with libraries to connect them, and the uh, electronically. Well, at that time, um, mainly phone lines. Uh huh. Okay. And later, electronically, but uh, and that still is existing. And I think they have an office somewhere here in Dallas. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Out on. Uh, uh, well, what was the what was the uh, purpose of ICUT? Well, I cut now. That's Independent Colleges and Universities of Texas. That's the Independent Colleges, and the basic uh, purpose of I cut was to uh, uh, have uh, pro propose and follow uh, legislation in Austin that would help the, the to, private schools. To have a voice in the legislature. That's that's correct. Yeah, how successful was it? Well, they, um, I forget it was, I think the first thing they did was what they call the tuition equalization bill. Yes. And it involved, it involved, uh, I think, uh, getting uh, injured students in, into higher education. And they had uh, the first bill uh, had a, a million dollars to work on. Well, now uh, there w there was a bill, and I don't know whether it came out of the ICUT group or not, but it it came to bear later on, in about uh, ten years later, uh, in the discussion of of whether. Uh, what had become the University of Texas at Dallas would have a law school. And uh, three of us, uh, A.J. Thomas, who was then acting dean of the law school, Dean Odd Interim, uh, Jim Zumberg, who was president of the university, and I as provost, went to the higher education board in Austin and made the case that they'd be better off to take the money that, that would, it would cost to found a new law school and and give it to SMU as a tuition subvention for Texas residents who wish to come to law school here. Is that part of the same that activity? Was, a, that was, was that a later out, thing? That was an output, uh, a result, a later result of that, yeah, really. Yeah. Well, that was very important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at some point, uh, universities become competitive like businesses oh, do. Yeah. And uh, we we were in a serious we would have been in a serious uh, competition if they had had a law school at that time. Yeah. Um, I was acting. Uh, Willis Tate was in, of course, involved. Uh, SMU was involved in all of this. Uh, I cut IUC and Tager. We haven't gotten to Tager yet. No. But. The, the same individuals, more or less, were involved, and I went to numerous meetings with these people uh, as a sort of an alter ego for 
Tag. For Willis, yes. I uh, mean, for Willis. And uh, the. Well, uh, you, were, you were dealing really effectively with, with the presidents and provosts and their representatives from yeah, all across the state. That's right. And uh, I was trying to pull a lot of these strings together. I cut. Uh, had, uh, Abilene Christian College, which was then becoming a university, Abilene Christian University, had a big affair and invited Willis to go to that. And he ha had me go instead at that time. And uh, I, I remember that uh, uh, Hackerman, what was his? Norm Hackerman. Norman Hackerman. He was president of was Rice. President of Rice at that time uh, was uh, intimately involved in ICUT. And uh, I remember when later when Bertner came, uh, he had been made president of ICUT and I guess that I guess when I visited out there, Berg, I believe Sundberg was was present. Well, it, it's entirely possible because it went on for yeah. two or three days. It may still be going on. I don't know. In fact, he, I remember his writing Sundberg and complimenting uh, my work with Ica well, at that time. And I and all the times that you and I worked together, I know that that you were heavily involved throughout most of your tenure here. Uh, well, let's move on to Tager before we run out of time. Tager was a different kind of animal, but these were all interinstitutional yeah, kinds of things. It, it was a it was a mi kind of a mix mismatch mismatch mash. Uh, you uh, the same people largely same individual were involved in a lot of, the, uh, of these inner inner university. Right, same cast of characters, just same a different subject. And in Tager. Uh, well, that, let's that, let's explain the acronym first. Texas, uh, the the Association the, uh, for Graduate Education and Research. The Association for Graduate Education and Research. And uh, I, I think it was Jim Mowdy, who was president of TCU, wanted to call it Tiger, yeah. the Institute, instead of the Association. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, the campus had grown out there. Uh, at. It's, it's what became UTD, yeah. Southwest Center for Advanced yeah. Studies. After GRCSW uh, continued to grow with the financing uh, the, that the TI people gave, and they uh, built a a large antenna out there with microwave dishes pointed to all. Participating, participating uni universities and TI and other industries, and this became to be known as the Green Network because Cecil Green was the guy that really pushed it. That, well, that financed it. Yes, and uh, well, Cecil <laughs> was a great believer in interinstitutional cooperation. Very much so, and and particularly in scientific areas. Yes. He had given, I remember I went with the group when he uh, gave the geophysics building in MIT, to, I forget what, it, what the, they call the, that. The, the green, green building. The green building, yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, Tager became quite definitely identified with this network, the green network. Yeah, because that was the the Green Network was the vehicle for that for, was, that for was sharing Tager. education. That was Tager. Yeah, yeah. and uh, well, and and the driving force of this originally was pointed towards uh, science and engineering, as I recall. That's correct. And uh, wasn't the SMU Engineering School one of the principal sources of engineering uh, education? Uh, yeah, and that was piped into. 
uh, not only to other campuses, but to various industrial plants, notably Texas Instruments. The, the first... Uh, and could lead to a degree. The first couple of years of Tager, the, the origi originating came from the SMU engineering people. Yes. Uh, TCU taught a mathematics course, but most of the, all of the engineering courses, and it was exclusively engineering at first. All of that then was de disseminated to these other schools and to uh, things like uh, uh, institutions like TI and uh, uh, other high tech. Yeah, Ling, Ling, Ling Temco. Ling Temco. And it also included ultimately the medical school. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and, and Charlie Sprague who was at that time head of the medical school, was quite involved in all of this interinstitutional stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the prob there were problems that um, were difficult to overcome because there were qualitative disparities between some of the participating oh. educational institutions. <laughs> and that was one of the things that ultimately made it hard for Cecil Green's dream to be achieved. Exactly. And it was a shame, but it was a fact of life. Yeah. Well, let's move on, uh, Frank. Um, Paul Harden, Willis decided to retire in 71, and Paul Harden was selected uh, by a three-person committee uh, chaired by Bill Clements, who was chairman of the then Board of Governors. That's right and Marshall Terry representing the faculty and Joanne Harris representing the students. And they were the, the delegation that ultimately selected Paul and recommended him to the board. And Paul came aboard in the summer of 72, am I right? That's correct. Well now, um, <clears throat> I had you, been you, uh, you kind of, uh, Willis continued as chancellor and you were really related both to Willis and to Paul during that period. Uh, primarily to Paul, Willis uh, uh, wasn't on the front line actively, yeah. but, but he, 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 he was still- A presence. A presence, right. Well, uh, Paul I, had a series of things hit him early on, uh, among which were um, problems with football and problems with the Southwest Legal Foundation. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how much you want to say about either of those or both of well, them. Well, uh, the, the football scandal, which finally came to fruition in the 87, uh, was underway. During By that the time, yeah. The, the so-called slush fund was a very a active operation at that time. Yeah, witness the fact that one of the things that Paul dealt with, one of the assistant coaches was caught paying bonuses for tackles. That's correct. <laughs> and Paul, without conferring with anybody, turned us into the NCAA. I don't, I, I don't know who he conferred with, but he did. <laughs> uh, and this was one of the factors that the, the final denouement of, 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 uh, of Paul. Of Paul. Uh, during, uh, I met, uh, Harden had me look uh, involved in the athletic thing with the uh, problem with Harold Jeske, who was chairman of the athletic committee, that's professor right. of chemistry. And Lester Jordan. Lester Jordan was some way attached to. Well, he was, uh, he had been athletic director and, and then was uh, uh, head of media relations or something yeah, like that. Yeah, but the three of us, I remember, uh, were involved in that and we had many meetings. I remember that uh, Jeske uh, had uh, long talks with the TCU and other, other groups. Well, uh, then there, th that preceded shortly the firing the football coach who was also the uh, athletic director, that yeah, was Hayden Fry. Yeah. 
And a lot of people think that Hayden was fired for his one loss record, but I think you told no. me that he was fired because of his budget management That's as, right. as athletic director. That's correct. As, as Paul once said, that uh, Hayden believed that a budget was an interesting piece of fiction <laughs> and operated in that way. Right. Well, then... Um, the Southwest Legal Foundation was another yeah. uh, situation. Um, back in, I don't know when, but sometime earlier, there, um, the Southwest Legal Foundation had made a, uh, a grant uh, or a underwrote uh, a lot that went into the building of the present law school. Yes. That was when Bob Story was both dean of the law school and that's correct. president of the legal foundation. Bob Story. And then later, Mr. Cecil came along. Uh, Andrew Cecil, that's right. Yeah. And he was, uh, I think, uh, there, part of that problem, correct me if I'm wrong, part of that problem was a clash of personalities. Oh, very much so. Uh, and uh, Paul Harden was injected into that situation. Frank Skurlock, who actually uh, he was the house counsel for the, the house counsel that actually reported to me at that time. I <laughs> I didn't I've forgotten that. Yeah, uh, but anyhow, uh, he he wrote a very strong letter approved by the board, the board of governors, board of governors. And, and Harden that. To make a long story short, short, finally resulted in the Southwest Legal Foundation moving off campus and on to actually what later became UTD. Well, and, and I think the, the letter ultimately, as I recall, was delivered in person by Paul to the Legal Foundation Board. It was sort of an ultimatum, wasn't it? More or less? Yeah, yeah I think you could call it that. <laughs> And uh, that was... Uh, Tony Galvin, of course, was very much involved in this. and uh, As dean of the as, law as school. As dean of the law school. Um, well, now, uh, the, there was, changing the subject a little bit, uh, there was rezoning of the campus at that time involving Leland Nelson. Uh, Am I remembering correctly? The physical yeah, layout of the campus. It, uh, it had to do, I think I was mainly involved w in, uh, with Lila Nelson and the uh, s start of, uh, of the cable. Okay, the cabling of the campus. Cabling of yeah. the campus. Yeah. Well, then let's, let's go on and talk a little bit about, uh, there are a lot of things. I mean, having worked with you, I know how many things you had on your desk, yeah. and we're just hitting a few of the yeah, I, I'm, higher peaks I, here. I, I apologize for the fact that I... <laughs> no, no apologies needed. Let's, uh, but let's get on to the hardened firing, which you and I were both intimately yeah. uh, involved in because we worked so closely with Paul. Um, well... Uh, I, uh, let me set the stage, and then I think it's important because you have a perspective on this that is interesting. Uh, the, there were two boards at that time, a, chair, a board of trustees chaired by C.A. Tatum and a board of governors chaired by Ed Cox, and the two of them came to see Paul yeah. uh, late in an well, afternoon. You need to back up and, and emphasize the fact that the board of governors was what was running SMU. That's right. The trustees were just... Um, um, an ancillary. Very much an ancillary. And, and there were, Board of Governors was approximately 15 to 18 people, something. Yeah, predom predominantly, predominantly Dallas business people. Predominantly First National Bank people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well now, um, nobody knows, of course, except uh, Paul Harden, Ed Cox, and C.A. Tatum, exactly what was said in that meeting. But Paul read it as uh, an ultimatum uh, to which he resigned. Am I correct in that's, that? That's right. Uh, later, I remember when Paul was, uh, had been president of this eye cut that we talked about. Right. Uh, 
he had just just quote resigned, and at that meeting he uh, uh, Netterman was, was going to take his place, uh, and he made a little speech and uh, and. Wendell Netterman was president of UT Arlington. Then. That's right. He uh, he said I was my time at SMU. I was hired and I was fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I came as I left, fired yeah. with enthusiasm. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the the morning after the session with Tatum and and Cox. Uh, Paul entered my office. Uh, incidentally, I, I don't know whether we said it, but I continued to be executive assistant to Paul uh, yes. when he came. Anyhow, he came in and he, he, he said, you won't believe what happened, and he told me. He said, what should I do? What, would you have any suggestions? And of course, I, uh, if I, knowing what I did, if I, if I had been uh, bold enough, I would have suggested that he, since he, his father was a bishop, a Methodist bishop in the Methodist Church, that he would have gone to the Board of Trustees because ultimately they held the university in trust. That's right, and uh, the the Board of Governors, you see, was acting independently. Uh, ostensibly as an executive committee of the yeah. board, but really as an independent entity. It really as an independent en entity. And uh, uh, I really think that had he taken that course that uh, there had been a lot of different history here at SMU. Yeah. But at any rate, they made a very substantial severance deal with him and, and he went, accepted it. went and became president of Drexel. Uh, Drew. Drew University in New Jersey. Drew. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, and one final thing then, uh, after that, that led to the appointment of a trustee committee, uh, Bob Cullum, Bob Dunlap as chairman and vice chair of the committee to find a successor. And correct me, and we're just about out of time, but I want, want uh, your comment. They considered Frank Rhodes, who was then dean at the University of Michigan, who ultimately withdrew. Uh, Singletary, Singletary uh, who especially. Was, especially who was president of the University of Kentucky. And he declined. And he declined. And that led them to Jim Zumberg, right. who was then chancellor of the University of Nebraska. That's correct. And Jim came in the fall of 75. Yeah. And uh, there were there there's a lot more history that after that, but we're essentially out of time, yeah. Frank. Anything uh, else I, that we need to enter into the record? No, I I, I became I could you continued with Zumberg and then for, for, until he reorganized, cleaned out the. <laughs> and and then I was lucky enough uh, to have you, you come to work. Well, uh, actually, you've been working for me for, during the Zumberg era. Right, I worked for you as provost, and then I worked for you as acting president. Both. And and jointly, really, for Bill Stalkup, who was then acting provost. Yeah, I apologize for the disjointed way. Uh, you don't need any apology. It was just fine. Because uh, my memory, uh, you, we were particularly interested in Tager and, and I gave all of my file on Tager out to UTD. <laughs> yeah, and, and people, I mean, that was an interesting uh, exercise in both interinstitutional cooperation and frustration uh, because exactly. it never really achieved the potential That's that correct. it should. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Frank, we thank you very much for well, uh, taking an hour to visit with us. I apologize us. for my... You don't need to apologize. <laughs> it was just fine. And uh, you have seen some things that none of the rest of us have, and it's important to have those <laughs> well, in the record. Well, it's been very disjointed. And, uh, in my 90 years, my, <laughs> my memory and my recall... Of <laughs> you, you have nothing to apologize for. But uh, uh, I... I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Well, uh, I'm delighted that we were able to, to uh, get it arranged for you to do that because yeah. uh, 
as I said, you We you could know. fill in a lot of gaps if we had another session. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, the, one of the frustrating things about these sessions is just exactly that, because one, during one, you think, oh, you know, we need to talk about this or that yeah, or the other, because yeah. we didn't talk about GURC at all. No. And uh, that was one of my bait and wars. This has been very disjointed, and I, as I say, I do apologize, but maybe I've oh, you, given something for the record that... Uh, absolutely, because you, you, uh, we have done nothing, to my knowledge, about a lot of the interinstitutional stuff or about uh, GRC, SW, and all of that, which was... Yeah. That was a decade. The 60s was a decade when there was a, an awful lot of change because before that the university had been somewhat a standalone operation and all of a sudden it became interrelated with a lot of, yeah. of other entities, not only educational but, but business right. entities. And the, the figures in all of this uh, involved people in the business community like Earl Cullum and... So right. And Plus, all of the presidents, Sprague, Jim Mowdy. And That's right. The Wendell Netterman. Uh, yeah. And, and, and even. Ultimately, Bryce Jordan. Right. Who and even schools like uh, up in Nenton, John Mosley. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah, in Sherman, yeah, Austin <laughs> College. Uh, I remember very well, because uh, I was in a few meetings with Mosley, and you were in a lot of meetings. and. <laughs> He was physically very involved in the in the meetings. Uh, many gesticulations. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, Frank, we thank you very much, and well, uh, I'm, uh, I think I think we've covered some interesting ground, and we appreciate you okay. sharing your perspectives with us. Very good.